I grew up with my two cousins. They were like brothers to me. VJ was the youngest of us, I was in the middle, and Prone was the oldest. I'm about a year older than VJ, and Prone is about 70 years older than I am. Prone used to do the typical big brother stuff with us when we were little kids like boss us around and pull immature pranks on us. I remember Prone once came up with a game called Doorknob because VJ and I kept farting in his room. The rules were pretty much, if me or VJ farted while in his room, we had to touch the doorknob before Prone sat on us. If sat on, we had to say whatever stupid thing he wanted us to. Then he would usually get off. It sounded simple enough to me, but as we played the game, there were inconsistencies and caveats that made the game more complicated. Prone had the right to sit on us even if he just claimed he smelled a fart. So this created a dynamic where we got sat on for offensive smells that had nothing to do with us. It should also be noted that there were no real consequences for farts that obviously came from Perone. He would even fart on us from time to time. This game was clearly unfair and was nothing more than a thinly veiled excuse to sit on us. I seriously doubt he even cared at all about the farting. He just wanted to sit on us because he thought it was funny. As an adult today, I see this sort of dynamic play out all the time. Larger power structures set rules for a stated purpose, but accountability and enforcement is very inconsistent because the rules actually serve a completely different purpose. A specific example that comes to mind would be the public outcry about Antifa violence. Just in case you've been under a rock for the last four years or so, Antifa is a militant left-wing movement that uses direct action against people and organizations they identify as fascist, racist, or far-right. Antifa uses nonviolent forms of direct action like obstruction and violent forms of direct action like vandalism, petty theft, and assaulting people with milkshakes. This group recently became the darling of cable news networks because sensationalism sells and right-wing outlets in particular focus on them because they serve as useful ammunition for the whole unhinged left narrative. They are a relatively harmless group and the foundational ideology of this group seems to breed less deaths than the more radical right-wing ideologies. Not a single person has been killed as a result of Antifa counter-protests, and from 2007 to 2016, left-wing extremists in general were only responsible for 2% of the 372 murders by domestic extremists. So, left-wing extremism is significantly less violent, and Antifa seems to be no exception, but many people still vilify them in ways they don't with outright groups. Some people blow incidents of violence out of proportion or dishonestly edit videos in order to paint a certain narrative. These people tend to have an agenda and do not present evidence and arguments in good faith. Other people repeat the dishonest narratives and share the edited videos because they may not be in the know and consume media uncritically. These two groups of people really could be topics of separate videos, so I'm not going to talk much about them. I am going to focus more on a different type of person who demonizes Antifa free speech advocates. Their whole case is that Americans should all have free speech. The rules that govern this school of thought in this context seem to be, one, using violence is wrong, and two, it is wrong to use violence or other means to silence Americans who have different opinions or political ideologies. The first part sounds reasonable, but a huge red flag here is that there is a lot of cultural overlap with free speech warriors and second amendment military fetish conservative types. The last time I checked, guns are tools for shooting things. That's not all that peaceful. So it seems like this crowd is not entirely against violence and they see situations where the use of violence is acceptable. I highly doubt they would be so adamant about the whole second amendment thing if they saw whatever situations that may call for using a gun as unjustified or wrong. This crowd also tends to be the first people to play defense attorney for cops who murder unarmed black men, so they definitely aren't against violence. They just moralize violence they don't feel as if they benefit from, or if they can't relate to the motivation of the violence. The second point they make could possibly be valid, but what they consider to be silencing people is a bit warped. A counter-protest to another group protesting is hardly an example of silencing the group being protested. The counter-protesters are just expressing that they don't approve of whatever the first group advocates for. The occasional scuffle that happens at these events are also not really examples of being silenced. The event just got a bit rowdy. 
I might as well say that Bears fans are being silenced by Seahawks fans when they show up to Soldier's Field. Sporting events also get rowdy and NFL games have just about as many scuffles and arrests as protests where Antifa is present. But the media either frames violence at sporting events in a lighthearted manner or they don't cover it at all. I could possibly be more sympathetic to this point if they're making a consistent case against things like cancel culture and deplatforming. Personally, I think that social media has created a dynamic where a person's flaws are hyper visible to the public and people are too quick to condemn others without giving them a chance to learn and grow as a person. Free speech advocates rarely approach this topic from this perspective though and only seem to care when certain types of people are deplatformed. This crowd tends to be very apathetic towards Colin Kaepernick for getting blackballed from the NFL just for kneeling and expressing his opinions about policing. This crowd only focuses on things like a professor getting a slap on the wrist for not using a student's preferred pronouns. This crowd only seems to be concerned with free speech they can relate to. They tend to be straight white guys who live in more homogenous communities. This puts them at a distance from most social issues that are being mainstreamed by news outlets and social media. Many of them have no clue why certain positions could be harmful to others. So from their perspective, they see everything that's going on and say to themselves, what's the big deal? The fact that anyone would want to punch someone like Richard Spencer or Stefan Molyneux seems uncalled for because they have no context. Shooting unarmed black guys because they look scary is justifiable, but simply wanting to punch an outright figure is inconceivable to them. All of this is nothing more than abstract ideas to them anyway, so being passionate about any of this is nothing more than being triggered to them. For the record, I'm not at all saying that people should go out and beat some ass in the name of whatever cause they feel justifies it. All I'm pointing out here is that some people, especially those who are comfortable within the status quo, have a tendency to moralize behavior in ways that keep them in comfort at the expense of other people. Martin Luther King once had this to say about centrists and moderates of the time who had an issue with the civil disobedience and riots of the civil rights movement. I have tried to make it clear that it is wrong to use immoral means to attain moral ends, but now I must affirm that it is just as wrong, or even more, to use moral means to preserve immoral ends. We really need to try to be more conscious of how our sense of morality can affect other people. We also need to be more conscious of the fact that our sense of morality is a bit subjective, and that other people who have power within society set the moral standards. People who have power or are comfortable within the status quo use infractions on their moral code as a way to justify completely ignoring deeper issues. This is why whenever there is a cross the aisle conversation about Antifa, it rarely goes beyond the milkshakes and arguments about who swung first. My take on all of this is that maybe people who care about the issues that Antifa is fighting for should consciously shift the conversation away from Antifa and discourse about them. Maybe if more people understand the motives, the group will seem less scary to them and they will be more willing to take an objective look at the group. But that's just my opinion though. I would love to hear what you have to say, so please leave a comment below. Also, if you like the content, hit the red subscribe button. Thanks.